G'day you mob, Pete here from Aussie English. Welcome to today's episode where I sit down with my old man, Dad. It's not a goss episode and we talk about Christmas, Christmas in Australia. So obviously I thought, you know, we should do an episode on this considering it is Christmas and it kind of took some interesting turns. As you guys know, I like free flowing conversations that, you know, we, we talk about whatever and everything that comes up. Today we talk about hairstyles and mullets. Uh, we then get on to Christmas. We talk about COVID and how that has potentially affected Christmas celebrations this year. And we talk about how Christmas has changed over the years since Dab is a little tacker, a young boy. And also a bit about consumerism, right? And capitalism and spending a lot of money on gifts and who should celebrate, celebrate Christmas. Should it be everyone? Should it just be Christians? Should it, you know, be them only? I don't know. But uh, yeah, it's a really interesting episode. I hope you guys like it. I hope you get to learn a little bit more about me and my old man, my father, Ian Smithson. And without any further ado, guys, let's just get into this episode. Merry Christmas, wherever you are, whatever faith you are, whether or not you're celebrating it. I just hope you have an amazing period of the year. Okay, let's do it. Alrighty. So, Dad, welcome to this episode of Aussie English. Hey, Pete. Hey, everyone. Before we get into it, guys, if you want the transcripts for these episodes, don't forget to sign up to be a premium podcast member. You'll get all the transcripts for these episodes so that you can read and listen at the same time, and you'll be able to use the premium podcast player as well to read and listen. It kind of reads for you. Anyway, so, Dad, what are we talking about today? Hey. I, I roped you in. I got I got a haircut for Christmas. You did? Yeah. The mullet is gone. The mu- It wasn't a mullet. No, we've got to do the definition. There's an Australian word for you. Have you had that one out? The uh, fish? No, the mullet, <laughs> not the fish. Uh, no, it's a mullet's also a fish. Uh, yeah, mullet is also a fish, but no, the mullet used to be a thing of the sort of late 70s and early 80s of the haircuts of people who had the short hair over the top and then the long rat tails, my grandfather used to call them at the back. Yeah, what is it again? Um, business at the front, party at the back? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so, but no, first time in two years I had a haircut. How does it feel? Uh, cold. It doesn't on, now, on but when I first, when I, yeah, when I first had it done, it was cold on the neck and the top of the ears. I went, ooh, what's going on here, man? <laughs> and you'd go to brush your hair away and there'd be nothing there. So, shave your head weird. like this, Dad. That's when you do the same uh, thing. You've got a good head. I've got an ugly head, I reckon. So, too uh, many bumps and. Yeah, bits and pieces on it. I remember when I had dreadlocks, I think it must have been around 2008, 2009, and I shaved those off. Yeah. For about a week, I still had a um, tick of any time something went close to my face, felt like it was in my eyes. I had this movement with my head thinking that was going to get the hair out of my face. Yeah, I had a um, a high school friend um, girl who had long hair for a long time, and she had this constant habit of she'd put use her middle finger rather than the forefinger. She'd just be constantly pulling her hair mm. out of her face, and then she got her hair cut short, and she would be doing the same thing, but there was no hair to pull out. Yeah. So it clearly had nothing to do with the hair on her face. It was just a, a habit that she got of you know, wiping you know, the, the non-hair off the face. So. Yeah, it's funny how those things sort of develop and then disappear. Uh, like it took me a, a few weeks, but then it went, and now, yeah, I don't think I can't imagine ever. Flicking, flicking my head flicking again, hair off his hair. Face. I don't think yeah. I'll ever grow the hair back. And even if I did grow my hair back, I doubt I'll ever have a fringe. <laughs> yeah, or dreadlocks, probably. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe a rat tail dreadlock rat-tail, at the back. Just a single rat tail. Yeah. I'll have a skullet. A the, skullet. The um, skull mullet, right? Yeah. Where you've got shaved on the top, but long at the back. Oh, yeah. Great. So, yeah, we can talk about that before we get into Xmas right. or Christmas. But um, mm. mullets, man. So, was that- were they first conceived in the 80s? Was it yeah, the late first 70s, ever experience? early 80s. I, I, well, yeah, obviously I only go back to the late 50s, but <laughs> I, in my living memory, that was when they hit. And I can't see any photographic evidence historically of, of people with those haircuts up until then. And it wasn't just men, it was women had them as well. <sighs> uh, that was yeah. the 80s thing, though, right? Of having like short hair on the top that you styled. Yeah. And then you have long, hair, the at long the back. hair at the back. The yeah. women or the female ones tended to be a little less offensive, though, right? Uh, some of them were fairly <laughs> offensive, but um, <laughs> mostly they were. You're right. That was sort of the quaffed hairdo on the top. Yeah. But the a little more subtle. Hair, a little more subtle. A little graceful, than, nicer. Yeah, than the men's. Mm. The men's were filthy. Yeah. yeah. They weren't that good. They've gotten way filthier, right? And I think that they, they're they sort of back in vogue now. I don't know if it's on the back of the hipster wave where yeah. everyone was giving themselves top knots. So, they effectively had the yeah, long the hair at the back buns. of the top. Yeah. Man buns. 
and um, shaving the sides of their heads, right? Yeah, which just looked weird. Yeah. Well, it kind of looked cool to, on yeah. a few people, you know, but, <laughs> but then everyone started doing it. And that was the ironic thing yeah. with hipsters, right? It was a uh, hipsters are kind of this you know, amorphous group of we don't conform to one another, but our lack of conformity is what conforms us together. Mm. It brings but us then together they all as a group. ended up looking and acting the same. Exactly. They all ended up mm. wearing um, flannels with beards and top knots mm. <laughs> and drinking coffee on, you know, Fitzroy yeah, Street, so Main Fitzroy. Street. Yeah. <laughs> Far out. But um, have you noticed recently in Ocean Grove, at least, every boy under the age of about 18 has a mullet? Have you noticed them? Well, at least has long the hair. I don't see. I, that's where I I wouldn't classify those as mullets because they're just long hair everywhere. Oh no, I mean like but I've there seen are, them with shaved there sides are some, of the heads. There are some, yeah, the shaved sides and the short tops. But yeah, I think just long hair just seems to have come back in. Uh, yeah, you know, you look at I know a lot of um, sporting people where you would think that having long hair playing competitive sport would be a disadvantage. There's a lot of men running around playing football and cricket and things that still have long hair. Uh, just not just, swimming. Just Typically. not swimming. Yeah, swimming, I think, would be a subtle disadvantage. But yeah, you know, stick it in that sort of you know, head thing and you know, have this great big bulbous head might be a bit of a problem. Do you find it interesting those fashion things to a kind of a metric that we can gauge people's class on? Because I would never imagine meeting someone from, say, Upper Turak, whose father's a lawyer and mother is a CEO, um, having a mullet. No, there's. It certainly was much more of the sort of working class Western suburbs in Melbourne and Sydney um, thing. Certainly in the the eighties, it became that. But then it became much more stylish when footballers, in particular, yeah. started wearing them. And you know, regardless of the social class from which they came, yeah. they became celebrities, and therefore celebrities automatically sort of get bumped up in people's estimation of their social class, whatever a social class may be in Australia. Yeah, uh, but which, you won't see you won't see politicians with them. You won't see no. it's not a business kind of well upper class business snooty formal no. haircut that no, you would ever exactly. see on someone. No, unless there's, like, there's a few businessmen who would have long hair, but it would just be long hair and tied back in a ponytail. It wouldn't be the you know the short cut or the sides off or the yeah. man bun. It would just be a long ponytail. So. It's so funny how that stuff kind of organises itself. That mm. there is this subtlety to. S- Showing which class, which group, which tribe you're a part of based on your appearance, right? And I think that even comes down to, you know, in recent decades, um, things like facial hair too, Mm. right? Besides just style. It is interesting that it is a hair thing too. Like, that's one of the biggest things I guess we can modify about ourselves. It is, yeah. It's one of the easy ones. And I guess tattoos and piercings as well. Yeah, but tattoos and things are permanent. Because hairdos and whether you've got a beard or not, you can change that really quickly at no cost effectively. Um, Certainly no cost to your body, (laughs) which, you know, if you've got piercings or tattoos, then, yeah, piercings you can just take out the hardware, Mm -hmm. uh, but you've still got holes in your skin. Well, I've still got Um, a scar up here somewhere that you can see Um, from when I was 18 and got a, an got eyebrow a piercing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I got sick of that when I kept taking my T-shirts off and it was ripping the... Mm. It was making the bit of skin that was holding it down shorter and shorter and shorter as it was tearing either side of it. And I was yeah. like, yeah, yeah, I tap can't, out. I, you know, <laughs> what do you do when your 18-year-old son does that? But yeah, um, just deal with it. I think that was your leaving school celebration yeah. of, you know, I no longer have an authority who is telling me what I can and can't look like. Well, I should have just got a mullet. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know. They were controlling those things. Going to a private school, they tend to be a lot more strict on. Yeah, well, you weren't even you allowed can to colour your hair. Do yeah, no, yeah. kind of couldn't even bleach it. No, I got no. in trouble for that. Yeah, because you can do whatever you want on the holidays, but then when you come back, you got to get back in line. Mm. But yeah, I, I love too. You you look through history, staying on the facial hair facial thing, hair. and how much that changes. That's not a recent thing, right? That oh no, no, we're going through, through getting through a long beard. Eras of- well, you look at Charles Darwin, st- like the 1800s, and people tended to have, you know, large beards. And then towards, I don't know if it was the mid-1800s, later on, they started getting those m- mutton chops and yeah. big-ass moustaches yeah. yeah. and, and you know, shaving around the mouth, though. They didn't typically just have these huge beards. They mm. would have been the people working on the mining sites and that sort of stuff. But the- Farmers. The gentlemen mm. were the big mutton chops. Yes. But then yeah. it seems to have cycled through. So, that would have been like grandpa's grandparents- their generation would have been the 1850s. Yeah. Grandpa's parents would have been the 1900s, right at the start there, maybe a bit earlier. Yeah, yeah. And they would have had, I imagine, maybe shaved clean faces because grandpa, I don't think I've ever seen him with facial hair. 
No. And I don't know if that's... Certainly my grandparents never had facial hair. Is that just the style at the time? Was You you keep your face clean. It looks very formal and... and Which was interesting because... um, the certainly in the in British and you're talking about British Commonwealth as much as Britain it's as a country, um, the kings for three kings in a row from the early twentieth century uh, all had beards. Yeah, uh, they were trimmed, styled beards, but they all had beards. But at the same time, the general public tended not to have beards mm. because that nineteenth century was very bearded. Um, and then beards really didn't come back in until the sort of 1960s. Well, and that was uh, the weird thing, right? Was... Your generation was the beards coming back, mm. the 60s, 70s kind of hippie era, and then moustaches, right, in yeah. there as well yeah. that came back on. I don't know if they were after the beards. Oh, uh, yeah, I think that was sort of 70s. So you grew the beards and then you shaved and them then and you left shaved the moustache. And then you shaved the moustache on, yeah. <laughs> was that a sort of movement at the time like the hipsters were in the sort of 2010s where all of a sudden it was kind of like a- it just came out of nowhere, it seemed, and then it was everywhere. Yeah, and well, I think I mean I think that sort of facial hair, the unkempt facial hair for men, um, came out of that sort of the hippie movement uh, in the sixties of you know just long hair and beards as yeah. as much Freedom. as anything else that was just anti-establishment because yeah. at the time the establishment was very nineteen fifties clean cut you know short back and sides hair cl- you know clean shaved face no facial hair at all not even sideburns and sideburns came in in the 1960s and 70s of you know just even hair down to the bottom of your ears um, yeah. that was considered to be fairly oh that's a bit radical <laughs> Watch out, don't let my kids hang out with sideies, this guy. Yeah, sideies. and they were and they were popular in the 50s but they were very trimmed yeah um and but again they were the sort of you know the rock and rollers used to have the, that's right. the pointy sideburns grease lightning sort of, right where they yeah, would have the yeah. grease in their Hair and, the, and the pointy and the side very stylized sideburns, but yeah, uh, but no yeah, facial hair, no facial hair other than that. No, yeah, except uh, certainly when I was a kid, um, a lot of the Italian and Greek men had beards, interesting. Uh, and and you could sort of almost you, you could almost pick a uh, an Italian or a Greek man because he had a beard, because uh, nobody from any other nationality in Australia, and they were, you know what we termed at the time New Australians. So yeah. they were uh, migrants to Australia post first the Second World War. Uh, but you could pick them straight away. You know, it was, oh, he's got a beard. He must be Italian or Greek. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, it's it's funny how those cultural practices can lead you into that stereotype. Mm. Not necessarily in a negative way, but that it makes you still stick out. I remember yeah. when I was at university, my one of my best mates was Greek. And his family were all Greek, obviously. And, and when we would go down to um, St Kilda Pier, he would just walk along the pier and it was like, you know, $100 that every single man here is Greek. Yeah. That's fishing. Fishing. Off the edge. Yeah. yeah with a pole. With, 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 with a pole. No, the no long pole. Reel. No, yeah, just a no, long pole long with pole. A, yeah. a thing on the end. And, and their little black fisherman's cap on. Yeah. yeah. And it was so funny because I guess it just never caught on with any Australian Australians, like the yeah. ones that were here before or during when the Greeks arrived, but yeah. that they just kept doing that practice. So, it always makes me think, if I go to Brazil, how am I going to be sticking out like a sore thumb because mm. of my- Facial hair or features or yeah, what I yeah, my behaviors. Your Australianisms. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we were going to talk about Christmas. We were. Yeah. So Merry Christmas, everyone. This yes. is probably going to come out before it probably Christmas. Probably will though. come. But hey, just December. It's Christmas. Yeah. So I think we've done a few of these episodes in the past, we but have. it's always good to kind of recap Christmas. How do you think this year's Christmas is going to be in in the broad scheme yeah. of things and on the micro level in Australia? Well, broad scheme, uh, it's actually quite difficult to talk about a broad scheme of things at the moment. Because, because it's different everywhere. Because it's different everywhere. Though, you know, it's obviously, the, the veil of COVID over the world still exists. And yep. it's, you know, it's not getting much better in many places. Um, so, I think there will be distinct differences in you know, particular countries as to what lockdown regulations there are. I heard you know, in the news this morning that um, Britain has gone back into lockdown but they're planning on loosening that lockdown um, on that Christmas week um, of yeah. saying that you know, you're, you'll be allowed to have, I think they were talking about a bubble of two or three families that could get together and so on. Uh, and I think the assumption was that people are going to do it anyway. So yeah. you might as well loosen the restrictions a little bit, give them another restriction that would be easier to meet and hope they do that rather than if you give if you keep them in a really tight, restricted and lockdown. And they just do whatever. They'll do whatever they like. Are. So... Um, so, I think there'll be uh, elements of those things. I mean, there'll be some countries like who knows what's going to happen in the United States in terms of lockdowns because clearly the current president doesn't believe it's a problem. Therefore, yeah. you don't have to lock anything down uh, and he will still be the president at Christmas time. So, 
Um, that probably won't change much, although you know, certainly talking to some of my American friends and relatives about Thanksgiving, it significantly changed people's typical Thanksgiving practice because in America, Thanksgiving is bigger than Christmas um, in terms of family get-togethers and so on, and it changed that. So I think there will be elements around the world where that will be a change. In Australia, I think it'll be, a, ironically, probably a bigger celebration because now we have got we've dropped most of those restrictions. I mean, we're allowed to have 30 people in our house now, um, and there aren't going to be too many families at Christmas that would have more than 30 people typically. Uh, but we've gone for what eight or 10 months now of being on and off you know, various restrictions. And so I think now Christmas is going to be a bit of a release for that. So there will be more of those big family get-togethers, I suspect. How do you think Dan Andrews is feeling currently? You um, can recap that if you want. I yeah, well, hopefully he feels like he has hero tattooed on his back permanently, <laughs> um, because yeah, Dan Andrews is the premier of Victoria, the yeah, you know, the parliamentary leader in the state of Victoria, yeah. uh, and he put on the world's tightest restrictions in the city of Melbourne when we went up to you know, I think it was in June we had seven hundred new cases in a day, seven hundred and fifty. Um, and he put the world's tightest restrictions on the state of Victoria and particularly in the city of Melbourne mm-hmm. to the point where people were not allowed to travel more than five kilometres and there are all the restrictions on what you, know, what you could and couldn't do at home. Couldn't have so anyone over, couldn't, couldn't see anyone. over. Yeah. Most businesses were shut down unless they could work um, you know, in the street so that you could, you know, a cafe could still sell takeaway coffee but you couldn't walk into the cafe to get it sometimes. Yeah. So all of those sort of things happened. Um, and there was a lot of people pushing back against that. But we went from 750 a day to none. In and about we've had three months, was about it? About three or four months. Yeah. And we've had 46 consecutive days of no community transmissions. Double donuts. Yeah. Zero, zero, double zero, donuts. Zero, Yeah, so no and deaths, no new transmissions. As the listeners will probably know, if they've heard previous Goss episodes with me and you, mm. I'm, I definitely lean much more on the libertarian side, at least, with respect to certain things. But it's interesting how much libertarian idealism or, um, you know, ideology doesn't seem to be able to hold up in the face of a pandemic very well, if at all. I mean, I'm sure there are certain aspects that we can still hold to, but it seems like you need to be able to give up some of your personal rights for a temporary period of time in order to get through because there is, I mean, America's obviously wearing the, the results of extreme individuality or individualism. Individual freedoms. Yeah, freedom, freedoms. Yeah. Where, you know, I can see the argument from that side of the government shouldn't be able to tell me whether or not I can leave my house or, or whom I can or, spend yeah. time with and how I can spend my time. That seems ridiculous. But when you look at what's happened in Australia and how we gave up our freedom to some extent for mm. about three to four months and as a result have now got zero cases and in Victoria. And we have much more freedom. And we have yeah. the freedom back. Yeah, yeah. so it's, it's a very difficult thing, isn't it? Because it's kind of like a... Um, it's kind of like you have to just sacrifice the short term for the long term. And I think the problem yes. is that governments need to work out how to communicate that to the public as well, as opposed to just the draconian kind of, we're telling you what to do yeah. and if you don't do it, we'll and send I, you to And I jail. think that was where Dan Andrews did very well. Because for... From... Almost this time last year, so the bushfires started in the second last week of December uh, over our summer last year, and until we had actually got to zero cases, he didn't take a day off work. Um, He had press conferences every day, every Monday, Mm -hmm. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Every day at like 10.30, 11 o'clock, he was out in front of the cameras. Uh, And... He had the same message the whole time. He said, yes, this is hard. I don't want to do it, but we are all going to benefit in the end Mm -hmm. if you all do the right thing. If we have a few people screwing up, we're all going to suffer. And that message just kept getting repeated and repeated and repeated. And so it was that feeling of we're all in this together. And that sounds like a sort of a cliched throwaway marketing line, but when it gets repeated so often, and not just by him, but by the chief medical officer, uh, who had the same message all the time. And he was he was the one who was charged, and he had the same thing. He had press conferences every mm-hmm. day for months and months and months. Um, and he had that same message, but he was backing it up with the science and saying, look, this is the reason we have done this. Um, and uh, the Premier was saying, this is what's going to happen if you don't. 
And so that dual message really worked. And most Victorians, even those who sit on the opposite side of politics, now there are a few who are still criticising you know, Dan Andrews for, oh, he shouldn't have done it. Yeah, look what's happened to the economy and so on. But the, yeah. the economy's largely bounced back. Pretty much. Now, there it's... are still some... There are a lot of individuals, particularly people in small business in the entertainment industry, uh, the tourism industry, and uh, the sort of food and entertainment sort of industries. Um, they have certainly suffered. Small businesses have suffered because, yes, they could get enough money to continue to employ people um, who are their full-time employees, um, but they couldn't be making profits anywhere because they couldn't... A restaurant can't open. Yeah, yeah they could do takeaway food, but... You're not going to make the same money doing that, but you know, they've they've survived mostly, and there will be individuals who haven't, unfortunately. It, it's but. so difficult for someone I th- to like Dan Andrews too, because when he does the right thing, and in the case here, get the cases down to zero for two, or nearly more, one, and one and a half, half two half months now, yeah. in a row, you don't know who you've saved because everyone yeah, thinks, exactly. oh, if I'd got it, I would have survived, or I'd never get mm-hmm. it, and it would be fine. But there are probably thousands, if not tens of thousands, of Victorians now that are not dead. Yes. because of the measures that went in, but no one knows who they are, and they can't themselves really show direct appreciation for having had their lives saved. No, exactly. And, yeah, that that's the hardest part about this pandemic, right? Uh, Dan Andrews is going to get high fives from us who are like, yes. you did a good job, but there's yeah. no one coming forward saying you saved my life saved without my life. you. No, exactly. So, so, anyway, back to Christmas. Christmas. So, you think it's going to be a bit different this year? Is it going to be a bit more um, crazy this year or oh, a bit more look, tame? I think it will... Uh, <laughs> I think it'll be a bit crazy. It'll be crazy for a couple of reasons. Um, Dad's going to get naked and just wasted. It's not going to get that crazy. Every single Christmas. No, no. Every, Every Christmas. Every Christmas. Yeah. Uh, pa. <laughs> yeah. um, no. Uh, I think it'll get a yeah, broadly, um, we could use the term crazy. I think it will be different because, firstly, we still uh, can't travel internationally. So, yeah. our, and yeah, to put it in context for anybody in the Northern Hemisphere, obviously, our Christmas occurs in summer here. And it's great. You should try it. Yeah, you should try it just once. <laughs> uh, but you can't. Not at the moment. Don't Santa come here wears yet. shorts and he goes on the beach with the reindeer. Yeah, come here next year. <laughs> uh, the the fact that we can't travel overseas means that, and because it's our big summer holiday period, yeah. where schools are off for six weeks and most people take a week or two weeks off work over that Christmas period, traditionally people would be travelling, and a lot of people would travel overseas um, for yeah you know, for their annual holidays. Uh, nobody can travel overseas now. Um, and so there'll be a lot more inside Australia travel. So, you know, places like Ocean Grove, where we live, I think will be just inundated. Uh, it already is. It's It feels now like the middle of January. Uh, mm-hmm. There are so many people around. And I think that's because people are going, oh, well, we can travel now, but we can't go overseas. Yeah. Um, so we'll, well just And go that's a sort of good locally. thing, right, for the local economy. Oh, it at is. Least. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, for the local um, n- natives of the, the natives, area, the, yeah. the non tourists. The non tourists. Yeah. You get to suffer a bit by not being able to find a patch of sand to put your towel on, not getting yeah, a exactly. parking but, spot. But, you know, it, it's, it, it's a bit churlish and selfish yes. to suggest that that's the case because certainly our local business people, um, again, particularly the people who are running. Yeah, restaurants, cafes, shops, and those sort of things. They make probably half or more than half of their annual income would happen during that Christmas to mm-hmm. January period. Yeah. Um, so it's huge in those sense because the population of our town triples over the summer period. Uh, so that I think will be that, and that'll be the case everywhere. We won't notice it too much because we're a holiday destination anyway. But I think there'll be a lot of places around, around sort of you know country areas, regional areas throughout the country that will suddenly have more tourism. And that's a good thing for those local economies. Uh, As I said earlier, I think there'll be more people who are having um, the unusual uh, big Christmas get-togethers because they can now. Mm -hmm. This will potentially be the first time that, oh, we can get the whole family. And fortunately, we're in, in Australia, we're in a position now where we have interstate travel that's been allowed again. Um, so people can travel from interstate to get bigger family groupings together and so on. So, uh, One of the weird different- side effects of, pun intended, of, of COVID seems to have been that now regional areas are having a lot more, a bigger increase in rent and the prices of properties. Yes. Because literally overnight, it seems, people are now moving out of the cities and mm-hmm. they're just like, yeah, screw this. So I think I was watching a news um show recently, I think it would have been ABC, talking about how 
rent in Tasmania has now skyrocketed and is is on par with the rest of Australia yeah. proportionately. Um, when it used to be only cheap nine months ago, live. yeah, it was one of the cheapest places in Australia to live, at mm. least outside of the big cities like Launceston and Hobart and Devonport, yeah. um, because no one wanted to live in those rural areas. But now they've got massive amounts of competition. That was what I was kind of like. Come on, house prices, plummet, please, yeah. <laughs> plummet, so that I can get in. Buy a house. Yeah. That's it. But they seem to have gone up, if anything, because people are yeah. moving out of the yeah, cities. Yeah, they, they dropped a little bit, but, uh, well, they bounced back, um, yeah. certainly in, in our town. Um, house prices now are above what they were a year ago. God damn it. Uh, <laughs> which means, you know, the drop has you know, bounced back over where it was. Yeah, so... um. How has Christmas changed over your life and how it's been celebrated yeah. in Australia? Because you've been around for nay 65 years. Nearly. Um, so, you were having... What was the first and earliest Christmas you can remember about 1960, 61? Early 60s, yeah. I couldn't put a year on it, but I, yeah. can, remember that I can remember having a baby sister. Yeah. And so, that puts it early 60s. They're the worst. Yeah. <laughs> the worst kind of sisters. Well, you never really baby had a baby ones. sister because she was close enough in age to you. We were you both were, babies. You were both babies at the same time and grew mm. up together. But yeah, I've got, I've got a sister who's four and a half years younger than me. And so when I was five or six, she was a baby. And that's the first Christmas that I can remember. I can't remember anything without her. What a horrible a, present. Uh, I can remember life without her, but I can't remember Christmas without her. Take her back, um, Santa. Take her back. Uh, well, she was, she was born in February. So you know, by the time <laughs> Christmas came around, it was you know, too late for that. Um, love you, Holly. <laughs> she won't be listening. She won't be listening. <laughs> Her uh, English is pretty will, good. <laughs> this will be the one episode that she listens <laughs> That's to. And it. She'll be on the phone going, "You bastard! What are you picking on me?" <laughs> uh, so yeah, so that, but our typical Christmas used to be that uh, because back then there was just yeah, it was mum, dad, and the kids. And um, my grandfather uh, lived in another well. Now a suburb of Melbourne. It was a little town on the Mornington Peninsula at the time. Back in my uh, day, back we used in to my get the day. horse and cart. Yeah, exactly. Two hours yeah, to yeah, get there. No, yeah, that's right. Saddle <laughs> up the dinosaur. And, um, and so, yeah, he would come up to our place for, for Christmas. And then, yeah, I can't remember. He wouldn't even stay overnight. He'd probably he'd just go home again. Yeah, on uh, the dinosaur. Yeah, on the dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just point <laughs> the dinosaur south and away you go. Um and so that was that was the, the little family Christmas, and we would usually have um, a couple of friends, you know, close friends of my parents would join us, uh, and and but we always at the traditional Australian Christmas, which tends to be the traditional Christmas in lots of places around the world, is the sort of lunchtime, la a large meal at lunchtime, middle of the day on Christmas Day. Our family, for whatever reason, always had that on dinner time, evening mm -hmm. meal on Christmas Eve. That sounds uh, like Kel and her family. Yeah, which they which is a very European decision, yeah. uh, sort of decision to do as well, that lots of European countries have that Christmas Eve is the big sort of celebration. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, the kids get their presents and things, or they might even get them Christmas Eve, but not allowed to open until Christmas Day, that sort of stuff. But, um, yeah, so we did that Christmas dinner thing on um, on Christmas Eve, and then... There was no such thing as Santa. It was Father Christmas. Um, I'm really? not sure. Yeah, we never called him Santa. Santa, did, Santa was an American thing. Jesus. Um, it was Father Christmas. Uh, it's Sounds exactly like the same character and exactly the same things used to happen. But yeah. so, yeah, yeah, Father Christmas came down the chimney and left your presents in the you know, stockings, except we didn't use stockings. We were greedy. We used pillow slips. Well, that's what I got um, when I was a kid. You did. Too. Never yeah, had stockings. Never had stockings. No. That's it. You can fit way more presents in a pillow. So exactly right. Especially yeah. if it's a double pillow. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that that all happened, um, and then just as sort of you know, years progressed, um, our family had kept that tradition of doing the you know the Christmas dinner thing on Christmas Eve, and I think my mother decided that she was doing it because. Again, Christmas in the middle of summer, um, it's often hot on Christmas Day, and mum didn't want to be cooking a roast meal mm. um, in the middle of a day on a hot day. This so, is before aircon. Yeah. So, and again, a lot of the time we would just have cold food. Yeah. Uh, we'd have cold ham or cold chicken or turkey or something. Um, sometimes it was, was hot at that time, so it had been pre-cooked. Um, yeah, and then I suppose when I got to be a teenager, we'd do that on Christmas Eve. But Christmas Day often, because we'd already had Christmas Eve dinner, um, Christmas Day was go to the beach. Yeah. And there was nobody there. It was fantastic because everybody really? else was at home eating. Yeah. And so, you know, there'd be very few people down on the beach True. Uh, on Christmas Day. So that used to be the sort of Christmas Day thing for us was go to the beach. And for you, that was only a sort of, what, a kilometre away? So you just uh, a few hundred metres away. Yeah. Not even, yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Far out. Yeah, easy walking distance. And then when I became you know, an older than that, you know, and I could drive, I was 18, 19, 20, um, I was in a sporting club that used to have a tradition of the president of the club would have people around for you know a chicken and champagne breakfast on Christmas Day. <laughs> Uh, so animals, yeah, and but you know because uh, you're driving and yeah, there was no such thing as pea plates back in those days, so yeah. you didn't have no those. breath breath tests. Yeah, well, yeah, they still existed. <laughs> Can but you do the weren't. sobriety test? Yeah, sobriety Touch test. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, so you didn't drink much, but again, it was the go for the chicken and champagne breakfast, then go and lie on the beach for the day. Mm-hmm. It was the worst sunburn I think I ever got. Was one Christmas Mike, day? You were trashed. No, I fell asleep on the beach. Yeah, so. Jesus. After a uh, sunburn woke you up. Chicken and non-champagne breakfast. Yeah. Far out. So, did you notice throughout your life that as uh, disposable income has increased for families, people started splurging more and more and more on presents and on Christmas days? And yeah. that's a good verb for you guys, to splurge, splurge to like spend to a lot of money, yeah. to, to lash out, to splurge. <laughs> yeah. Getting caught up there. The camera's... Uh, Cut off, but we're back. You we're remember back. from we're when back. you were a little yes. child, huh? Yeah, remember as a because obviously as a little child you have no concept of monetary value of things. Well, everything's free. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, you, or you don't get it at all. Or you don't get it at all. <laughs> That's right. Everything you've got, you've got, and everything you didn't get, you didn't get. Life is great. You, there was Bills. always, yeah. I mean, we were you know typical sort of suburban middle class family, but you know, single income family. We didn't have a lot of spare money, um, so there wasn't yeah you know, huge amount of splurging on things for that, but. Uh, and there were things that I'm sure that as children we uh, asked for. And as soon as you ask for something as a child, you expect it. But that my parents simply couldn't afford. And so you went without. But- could, you, could you guys just imagine you have this thing? That could be the game we play. Just yeah, imagine yeah, exactly. that you have imagine the Imagine the, the tennis want. racket. Go out and play with a stick <laughs> in the backyard. Um, well, Dodd, Don Bradman did that, right? With a it, pole and a golf ball Yeah, or something. exactly. Australia's yeah. best cricketer. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah, so I suspect, and I suspect there are still plenty of families that are in that situation yeah. where they can't give things to their kids that they want to. Uh, and look, you know, from the uh, sensible side of me, I sit there and look at it and go, "You don't really want to be spending thousands of dollars on presents for kids for Christmas because mostly they're over them in five minutes anyway." <laughs> Found uh, that out with Noah. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, I think now. I, the one thing I do remember, getting back to your question, the one thing that I do recognise now is advertising. Advertising when I was a kid for Christmas was little things. They were always, you know, go buy, buy this for Christmas, buy that for Christmas, and you know, buy this for your kids. And Get you a see roast. it on television, or yeah, and they were you know small items, and yeah, the the monetary value obviously is irrelevant because yeah, the cost of living has gone up so much um, relatively. That you know, it's something that cost a dollar when I was five years old would now cost thirty dollars, um, yeah. and and so, but now you see advertising for things like you know spe- go out and buy a you know PlayStation for your kids, and you're talking about five or six hundred dollars mm-hmm. for something that you know I would have been happy to have something that cost two dollars. You know, I remember that you know, one of the first things I bought, which. I, my parents decided that they couldn't afford to give me for Christmas when I was eight years old was a chess set, mm. and it cost me a pound, uh, one pound, which is the equivalent of two dollars. So this was clearly before uh, 1966. It was. Yeah, I was eight <laughs> years old, and, and I went and bought a chess set. Yeah. Um, and so that's the sort of thing where you're talking about. You know, you, you can't imagine now seeing you know advertising on television of go out and buy your kids a twenty dollar chess set. You know, it's, it's always water pistols. On TV, I think. Yeah. And the latest yeah. gadgets, these little Lego things. The little but They are things. ridiculous. Lego is bloody expensive. Yeah, but you don't see, go out and buy your kids the $10 little Lego kit, they can build something. It's go out and buy the castle that costs $200. Well, you and, wonder how much uh, that's to do with the cost of advertising too, where you oh, probably yeah, you're not want to advertise, advertise crap. Yeah. expensive stuff, right? If you advertise things that cost a mm. dollar, you're going to have to sell quite a lot of them to justify the ads. Exactly. But yeah, so I think there's an element of that, that you know now there's also an expectation, I think, in... Um, retail, certainly in retail, in clothing and toys and things, that Christmas is the big deal. Christmas is when shops are going to sell a lot of stuff. Well, we've seen in your time, I imagine, Black Friday and, you know, all these oh. Cyber Monday or whatever yeah. the hell it is, all these these um, holidays come in. Like Black Friday 
it's meaningless in Australia. Exactly, but everyone jumps. Like, I've you have jumped to do on it. it. You, you know, have like, to do it. Now. Yeah, it's yeah. just some. It's weird how it becomes a cultural thing where as soon as it's done in America, everyone else starts doing it elsewhere, and then everyone else starts doing it, and mm. so it becomes this thing that is now synonymous with Christmas in Australia. Yeah, even well, though Boxing has, Day, the Boxing Day. Yeah. So, and Boxing Day is a very Australian thing. There's the twenty sixth, the day after December. Christmas. Yeah, which in Australia is a public holiday. Kel loves that. Yeah, she was like, we yeah. never had we, this in Brazil. We get a holiday for. Getting over Christmas. Well, not even that, that all the stores have Boxing Day sales. Yeah. And so, yeah. you get all these things for 50% off after Christmas Day because yeah, they're exactly. trying to clear their they're stock. They're trying to clear all their stock. That, <laughs> yeah, this is the stuff we thought we were going to sell and we didn't. Um, and so, but it, ironically, a lot of people save up for Boxing Just Day. Just for Boxing Day. Yeah. They don't spend And these Christmas. are big ticket yeah. items too. These are traditionally uh, you know, white goods, things like washing machines and fridges and stuff that you can go and yeah. get for you know, significant discounts uh, on Boxing Day. But uh, yeah, so that, that sort of Boxing Day sale thing didn't exist. Uh, mm. Boxing Day was just a public holiday, yeah. and it came, I honestly couldn't tell you when it came in. But when I was a kid, it didn't exist, or maybe I didn't take any notice. But certainly, didn't have my parents running out to buy things the day after Christmas. I think they'd had enough of buying things leading up to Christmas. It's, it's a weird sort of phenomenon, isn't it? Though, with you know how how much the cost of living has gone up, and yet how much people are spending on frivolous shit. Yeah. Nowadays, it's and advertising and marketing, that's what. But it's weird that you can, like, you it. can't, aff- like, the cost of living is so much, but we can still afford to buy all this crap that we don't have or money for. So we still get credit cards and we get into debt. And, mm. you know, it's, it's very weird because you would imagine that the average person now, even in the lower class, probably has more um, material goods than, say, your parents did oh, back much, in the day when they were more. in the middle class. Mm. So, it is a peculiar thing. Do you think we've gotten too uh, consumer-focused and everyone's yeah. just like, my the way that I show love and appreciation is by collecting crap and giving people presents and all of that sort of stuff, where there it, it comes from a good place, but it sort of seems to be, it seems to be taking the place of real engagement and experiences mm. and- one-on-one time with people because I even feel that with Noah at times where I does he I'll need go another out. T- truck exactly I go to a store and I see something and I'm like oh man Noah would love that and you're like yeah he would for about twenty minutes yeah. but then, and then really it'll just go in the pile of 10, 20 others yeah exactly and what am I buying that because I think that's going to replace me having to play with him you know it becomes one of those mm. things too I'm like is this w- w- whether consciously or subconsciously Am I trying to show my love for someone by spending money on them when in reality what they really would prefer, you would imagine, is one-on-one time with you, which is just costs your time. It doesn't cost money. So, do you think we've moved further towards that? I think we have. I don't- uh, It's pretty existential for a Christmas episode. It is, yeah. (laughs) It is deep stuff. He didn't warn me about this. I think on the fly. Um, I think there's an element of that, but I, I think as much as anything else, it's uh, parents have always been, you know, I, I'm sure for 100 generations, parents have wanted better for their children than they had themselves. Uh, now, up until probably the last two or three generations, that has really, you know, most people in the sort of working and middle class, and middle class is a very modern thing anyway, mm-hmm. uh, but most people who spent about as much money as they earned so that was sort of working class thing, um, couldn't afford to have a lot of that stuff to improve the lives of their children just by spending more money. So a lot of that, you know, and certainly when I was growing up, there was, you know, my parents were very much on, you know, we can't give you any money, but we can give you an education. And we did the same thing with you and your sister. Of, you know, the most important thing we can give you is, uh, apart from us and our love, is an education because that gives you the opportunity of creating a life for yourself. Yeah. Dad, help me buy a car. I'm 18. Get a job. Get a job. <laughs> yeah. And part of that is about you know, responsibility and yeah, 100%. valuing it and all those sort of things. So I think there's an element of that. I think now, though, there's uh, that consumer society thing is, much, is as much about people's expectations as it is about their intentions. And that, you know, if we look at even houses, you know, when my parents bought the house that I lived in for, you know, until I was in my early 20s and my mother lived in until she died, so she lived there for 40 years, um, they moved into that house and with a bed and two chairs. That was their furniture. Jesus. They They made a table out of a couple of 
crates and boxes and they lived with that for a couple of months until they could afford to buy a table and then they could afford you know, a sideboard. And, I guess this is and, in the day too before Ikea or before yeah, factories before there in was, China so where if you're you going to buy, buy a table, stuff. you buy yeah. from a local carpenter exactly. and it's taken him how long to make, which yeah. is... So, you're paying for the value of people's labour and, and so I on. couldn't. I mean, I probably couldn't afford to buy a table from a local carpenter because it would be thousands yeah. of dollars. Yeah, exactly. Right? But fortunately, there's yeah. Gumtree and yes. we can get all the second-hand <laughs> yeah, stuff exactly. or you can go to Ikea and yeah, it's- and buy good quality stuff reasonably cheaply. So, so uh, there was that, and you know we had we were a family of you know mum, dad, and the three kids, um, and we lived in a three bedroom house. So you know I had two sisters, and my sister who's closer to me in age, she and I shared you know the, effectively it was a two bedroom house with a you know an open plan play area, which we turned into a bedroom when the third sister came along, and I moved out into the playroom to call it a bedroom. Um, but that's the house we lived in. It had one bathroom. Uh, it was a two-story house, and yeah, it was one of the few houses that I can ever remember uh, that had two toilets in it. You know, we just happened to have a toilet associated with a laundry mm. uh, downstairs, but it was you know, one bathroom, two bedrooms, and that's what your average family expected to have. Now, your average first home buyer expects to buy something with four bedrooms, three bathrooms, a double garage, you know, fully landscaped, and you pay your money and you walk in. Um, and and so that's why the cost of living has gone up in a sense that now, our, yeah, back in my parents' day in the 50s and the 60s, the cost of living was as much about the cost of food as it was about anything else. Yeah. Uh, now the cost of living is almost entirely rent and uh, yeah, mortgage repayments uh, in terms of you know, the biggest item that you're going to be paying off on a weekly or a monthly basis. Uh, so I think that has changed so that people now just expect to have more. They expect that, you know, when your first house is going to be the house that you can effectively, you know, live in for the rest of your life and have, you know, have as many kids and everything else you want. Uh, whereas in my parents' day, it was certainly where well, you got what you could afford. And and my, you know, this is pre-credit cards, of course, but my um, mother and father and my grandfather, um, who was the only grandparent I knew, my mother's father, they all said never borrow money to buy anything other than a house. Yeah, which you know, is you're never going to have the money to pay to for too. a house. Uh, but yeah, you know, the whole idea of you know, buying, getting something without paying for it and paying for it later was just Foreign ridiculous. Concept. And it was it was available, but the loan sharks. Yeah, yeah. You you know you <laughs> pay could, it back or we'll break your or legs. Or you could you know, back in the days, and I don't think lay by still exists, but I don't know why. I don't know how many people ever use it. And lay by was you'd go to a shop and you'd buy something. But if it cost you ten dollars, you'd pay a dollar a week for it. But you'd come in and you'd pay your dollar, and they'd keep it until you'd finished paying for it. So yeah. all you were doing was guaranteeing that you'd get it for the price when you first paid for it. You didn't get it and then pay for it later. No. Now um, we have afterpay and all these yeah, different it's ways. Yeah, all those different ways of you debt. getting getting stuff that you don't own, <laughs> that mm-hmm. effectively, uh, because you're still paying them off. Um, so I think that's changed, and and I think that has had an effect on Christmas as well. That you know, if you got a you know, couple of kids, you don't have to have $1,000 to go out and buy them presents. You just have to have $1,000 on a credit card that you can do it. And then- Pay that, it off later. Pay it off later or not. And that's how people get into trouble. Mm. You know, I mean, I, this is you know, not a, a lecture on you know, household finances, but I grew up in that thing of you know, never owe people money. Never lend people money and never owe people money. You know, live within your means. Live within your means. And you know, if that means- <laughs> to use the word for a different reason. Um, if that means that you can't have something, you just go without until you can afford it. It is interesting, isn't it, that we're sort of at that point now where it's like, but I want it. Yeah. And so, want has taken over need as a focus. Oh, yeah. And look, want and need were always an issue. Mm. Um, but want and need, the difference with want and need when I was a kid was you could still go out and get it if you wanted it and you could afford it. Mm. Um, but... There was always that thing with my parents of why do you want to spend money on that? You know, what you'd you're be a triage, better off. You're, what yeah. you, you know, and I, it was always. It was never for for my parents. It was never. Do you spend your money on that or that? It was always. Do you spend your money on that or not spend it? Yeah. <laughs> there was never. Oh, I've got money burning a hole in my pocket. I'm going to go out and spend it. It was. I'm going to save up until I can buy the thing that I absolutely have to have or mm. the thing that I really want. Um, it was never, oh, I've got $100, what can I go and buy? You know, mm-hmm. was, so you think that's so, changed more recently? I think it, it has. Be much I, more, I think there is more of the that. money's there, let's use it. Yeah, but because it's not money, because mostly it's credit. Yeah. 
for a lot of people. Bringing it back as we finish up here yeah. on on Christmas, has the religiosity of Christmas changed in your lifetime? Um, not me, because we didn't live in a religious household. Yeah, but um, broadly speaking, but broadly Australia, speaking, I think it does. Um, and yeah, certainly I had you know, lots of friends that you know, weren't particularly religious. They weren't regular churchgoers. They weren't apparently religious. Who would go to church on Christmas Day? Yeah. There are lots of people who still do that, but I think many people now treat Christmas as a uh, community holiday um, and a family holiday, much like the American Thanksgiving idea, which you know, we don't have that concept in Australia. Um, but we have that Christmas is now a time for families to get together and celebrate, uh, which is a good thing, regardless of whether you're religious or not. The religious overtones are still there uh, because you know you look at, you know, even most Christmas cards will either have yeah. you know, a religion. You know, does Jesus. anybody receive a Christmas card anymore? They'll always yeah. have you know, baby Virtual Jesus. One. Or they'll be you know, Santa and pine trees with snow. Yeah. Um, and frankly, Santa, pine trees, snow and Jesus are all about is irrelevant in Australia. Mm. <laughs> because well, Santa we don't have snow. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, it's, uh, so do you think that Muslims, Jews, non-Christians should or can celebrate Christmas? Well, and, and you know, I've got some Jewish friends because you know, Hanukkah is a... Uh, yeah, it was a uh, week ago, was it? Yeah, it's it's a December holiday. Yeah. So they would, yeah, all right, well, it's it's the holiday season. And certainly I worked for a Canadian company for 10 years. And in Canada, certainly in the business world, there's a, um, it's all it's almost a sort of forbidden to say happy Christmas to someone because that's considered to be culturally unaware um, of people who don't believe in Christmas, mm. you know, for either religious or cultural reasons. And so it was all very, it was always happy holidays. It's um, so weird though, because for us, we're an atheist family. Yeah. And you still say happy Christmas. You would say Merry Christmas and it yeah. doesn't, it's not an offence thing or you no, don't even think no, about it. It's no. become just synonymous with this is a... I, I think it's just sort of over, overly politically correct. Yeah. And that doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> happy holidays is a yeah. more generic thing to say and there's nothing wrong with saying it. Um, but for, uh, you know, certainly for me, and you know, I'm irreligious, uh, um, for me, when I say Merry Christmas or Happy Christmas or whatever to someone, I'm not wishing them anything on a religious basis. I'm simply saying, recognising that Christmas is a time of celebration and I hope you have a good time. <laughs> it's- mm. Well, so finishing up, what is something that you normally give uh, a family member for Christmas? And what would you not give family members or anyone for Christmas? What's sort of like a, an, an ideal Christmas present and an a non-ideal ideal Christmas present? Well, so it depends on the family member. But look, for me, ideal Christmas presents have always been... Ideal presents for people. So, Christmas is no different Cash. from birthdays. Well, yeah, for, for, for the other person sitting at the table here, um, it was, what do you want for Christmas? Nothing. Just give yeah. me the money. Yeah. Well, I wasn't going to spend any money on you. So, yeah, that was easy. Um, I was giving you time. <laughs> yeah. For for me, it's... Well, for people younger than me, I would try and give them something educational. Yeah. You know? So, you know, you give them books or... You know, vouchers for books. Vouchers for books or games, puzzles, those sort of things. Um, for people who are older than me, I try and give them opportunities for experiences yeah. rather than giving them stuff that they don't need. And for some people, including, you know, just some relatives and friends and things who just say, don't give me anything, like, really, yeah. but I will spend money on a charity on their behalf. So, you give them, you know, hey, I spent $20 on this for you and, you know, in your name, and they get the little certificate that says I'm, you know, sponsoring a legless lizard in Western yeah. District's grasslands in Victoria, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, so there is a recognition that, yes, I'm giving you a gift because I think you're a valuable person in my life and, and so on. Um, but I'm not going to spend money on crap that you don't need, um, but I'll you know, donate to something that you would probably appreciate as well. I think something for the listeners too, especially if they are non-Westerners that have moved to or come to Australia, a big thing is cooking yes. for other people. Yeah. Whether it's a meal that you cook up and you have people over or it's individual, like, for example, Kel got paid one of her friends to make a whole bunch of these muffins and brigaderos this, this Brazilian sort of dish, food, dessert thing, and then she's going to sure. give that to people. So, that's a really good one that's affordable that most people can do. It's find something that's 
a, you know, a recipe from your culture mm-hmm. or country and potentially work out a way of making a batch of those and handing them out to people. Because I'm sure I would love to receive food from any other culture that I've never experienced before or that yeah. I don't know very well. Yeah. And, you know, it's, yeah, affordable. Yeah. Just give and it a whirl. Yeah, I know um, someone who is culturally Jewish but is not religious and he holds a Christmas Day event at his home for people who don't practice Christmas. Yeah. So, those people who are not going to be out at family events and things and therefore have nothing to do and nowhere to go and there's nothing else open. It's one of the two public holidays in our calendar that effectively everything shuts down. Um, and he just holds this open house and that's his Christmas present to a lot of his friends mm. who are that way. He just said, just come around and you know, I'll provide the food and the drink and Let's we'll have a good soused. time. Yeah. <laughs> Too good. All right, Dad. Well, Merry Christmas, and Merry I'm Christmas looking forward everyone. to, to having, happy holidays. Yeah. Having a um a good Christmas day with you guys. I think we'll be doing it down here, right? What will our Christmas day be? Hanging out here, hanging down out, near the beach. Hanging out. At, uh, depending on the weather, it'll be hanging out in a house, uh, trying to get with out air of the rain with air, or <laughs> hanging out in a house with the air conditioning Hiding on. From too. fires and floods. Yeah. Well, we had, don't have any fires at the moment. Yeah. Certainly down this way, but uh, hopefully we don't. Yeah, I can't wait for the probably. It might be next Christmas when Noah starts anticipating Christmas Day. I don't know what age you reckon. It's about three, two, two, and, a half, two and a half, three. I'm looking forward well, to experiencing that for the first certainly time. Certainly his cousin, who is a year and a half older, <laughs> she's, she's a bit. fired up. <laughs> she is ready to rock. Because her birthday is in November as well. So she's just turned three and she's had the big she's ready you know, to cash birthday in party. Her chips. So this she's is like, people come to a party and give me stuff. Here come the really good presents now. Yeah, exactly. It's no, no, no more of these dolls and blankets and stuff. Yeah. No, that, that'll be fun. Anyway, thanks for joining us, guys. Have a good Christmas wherever you are, and we will chat soon, I'm sure. Yeah. Bye. Peace out. <laughs>